So if you've been on the web recently, uh, you've probably seen something like this, right? That's still, in 2012, the main way that we log into websites, the main way that we prove our identity to uh, websites. Now, there's lots of problems with that sort of simple scheme. Um, first one that comes to mind is security. If you've been following the news recently, you've uh, probably seen a couple of pretty high-profile com companies apologizing for uh, leaking user passwords after they got hacked, right? Now, I could pick on any one of these, but the reality is that it's really hard to do this right. Having passwords for users in your own database is kind of a liability, right? It's hard to do right, and if you lose it, bad stuff happens. Now, of course, you're all really smart developers, so you know that the proper way to do this is to do a couple of rounds of vcrypt, or even better, scrypt, and then you have per user salt and site secrets. So you're doing all of that already. But uh, not everybody is doing that on the internet. And even if you do all of this, let's be honest about the kinds of passwords that people are going to pick, right? Uh, just a hint, that big word in the middle is not that's the title of that slide. That's the most popular password by far. Um, <clears throat> so even if users were to pick good passwords, what happens when LinkedIn gets hacked, right? What happens when large sites get hacked? Do you reset all of your users' passwords? Because they're using the same one on your site, right? So lots of questions. Another one, um, another reason why this sort of scheme fails often is uh, has to do with conversion rate. Now, if you look at metrics, typically what you're going to see is something like this. Lots of people come to your sign-up page. They want to try out your new service. But somehow, the people that reach the end of the sign-up process, it's a much smaller number, right? A lot of people actually start the sign-up process, and then when they come to the, to the uh, point where they have to pick a new password and remember it, it's just like, oh, it's too much. I don't actually care that much about your site. I mean, it's asking a lot for people to, rem to remember things. So this gap is actually costing you real money. Right? It's worth paying attention to. Now, you might, you might say, oh, no, that's fine. You know, people have password managers. They use, like, LastPass or whatever, all sorts of other products. Um, but no, people don't use these things. We're geeks. We use them. Um, in fact, not everybody here uses them. I was talking to a couple of people last night at the pub, and uh, there's lots of people in this audience with really crappy uh, ways of dealing with passwords. So, you know, it's a real problem. There are existing solutions. There are other ways than uh, this sort of simple username and password thing. This one is really cool. Client SSL certificates. Now, how many people can you raise your hand if you've logged in using a client SSL cert in the last week? Week, yes. OK, like three people. The last month. OK, a bit more. Last year. OK, it's still not a lot. It's still less than 10 people. Um, there's lots of reasons why that's not very common. Uh, it works in really sort of limited, restricted environments. Um, but there's usability problems. There's implementation problems, both on the, at the browser level and on the server side. Um, it really kind of doesn't work on the web for one reason or another. What is really used is this. Websites outsourcing their identity to uh, sort of central authorities, like Twitter and Facebook. Now, that obviously doesn't work if your users don't have Facebook accounts, or if they don't want them, or if they think that logging into your site using their Facebook account is kind of creepy because they think that you're going to know all of their friends and, and know their dirty secrets or whatever. Um, and, but, but another problem is that if you have a business, you're list of customers is kind of the most valuable thing that you have. Do you really want that to be under the control of another for-profit company? Because when people log in with these systems, like that's the way that you get, you get access to your customers. If, you, if, the, if suddenly you know, Facebook or Twitter were to shut, shut down that service, um, you would, your, your database would kind of be useless. Um, it's definitely not the answer for the open web. If, you, if we're looking for the identity solution for the open web, that's just not it. It's not acceptable. OpenID. 
OpenID has a, a really great feature, which is that it brings back the idea of um, distributed identity into the web. Now, <laughs> which is great. Like any, anybody that has a, a domain or, a, or, or something like that that provides a service can expose OpenID endpoints, and then people can choose who their identity provider is. So it's not a centralized system like the previous ones that I showed. The problem with OpenID is that there's lots of problems. Usability is a big one. People tend to not associate themselves with a URL on someone else's site. Um, there's problems when you have like identity providers are unreliable, things like that. Uh, it becomes really difficult to debug. But the main reason why Mozilla couldn't get behind OpenID and use it for all of their stuff is because of privacy. OpenID has a has a really poor sort of privacy story. And I'll, I'll give you just an analogy to, to illustrate that. Imagine if you were going to check into a hotel, right? And so as part of the check-in process, they ask you for a piece of ID to make sure that your name matches what's on the reservation. Now, what if at that point they were to call up the government and say, hey, you issued this driver's license. Is it valid? And then the government would say yes or no. Well, at that point, what would be really creepy about this is that the government would have a list of all of the hotels you've ever checked into. Right? And they could also decide, based on other information they have, to not let you in. For example, you've got a student loan you haven't fully repaid, and now you're trying to do, like, you know, you're on a shopping holiday in Sydney. They might say, no, that's frivolous travel. You should concentrate on paying back your debts. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, that, it's kind of creepy, but unfortunately, that's the way that OpenID works. The, 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 your identity provider is, sits in between and is actually a gatekeeper of all of that stuff. Now, of course, you can run your own identity provider, in which case, it's not really a problem. But if we're looking at a solution for the average web user, that's just not it, right? People are not going to use their own. They're not going to run their own identity provider until everybody has a freedom box in their homes. Um, but, you know... That's uh, maybe unrealistic. So the good news is that we're building a new system, which um, I think doesn't have any of the problems that I talked about. And it's called Mozilla Persona. And it's distributed, so it's not centralized. It is privacy sensitive. So the identity provider that you have will not know all of the sites that you're trying to log into. It's simple, so both for developers we're trying to keep our APIs really, really simple. And, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. But also for users, we have a very strong focus on user experience. We have a, a full-time uh, UX designer uh, on our team. And, uh, and we don't share her with other people. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the other thing is, of course, as with everything that Mozilla does, it's open source. Um, now, how does it work? If you uh, only remember one thing, that should be it. It's based on the idea of verified email addresses. So you have a proof that you own your email address, and that's all that a site needs to be able to, let, to log you into that site every time you visit the site. So you have an email instead of a username and a proof that you own the email instead of a password. Now, first step, of course, is to get that proof. If we think of, uh, say, international travel, what you do is you, to, to, in order to be able to, to like, uh, travel to Australia, for example, is that you go to the DIA and you get a um, New Zealand passport. Right? So you do that ahead of time before you, you, you schedule to travel, you get your passport, whatever, filling out the forms and stuff. And then when you actually arrive in Australia, like weeks later or months later, you present your passport, they look at it under UV light or whatever it is that they do, um, and then they let you in. So similarly, the first step is to get the identity, to get that sort of passport thing. Um, you do, now, the identity provider that will give you this is your email provider. So the email provider um, asks you to authenticate or whatever. So if you log in into Gmail, you'll do the whole two-factor authentication thing. Um, so you logged in. Then the browser generates a public and private key for that email address, sends a public key to the uh, email provider, and 
at which, um, at this point, the, the email provider already knows who you are because, because you're logged in. So what they can do is they can sign your public key and return it to you. So here, what you have is this. You have a signed statement from your email provider that you own that email address. What can you do with it? You can use it to log into a site like this. So this 123 done is a demo site that we have where it's basically a, a, a task manager, a very simple task manager, and it uses Persona. Now, if you click on the sign button at the top, what you get is this. This is um, just a list of email addresses for which you have uh, one of those certificates that proves that you own the email. So I've got two email addresses in there. I'll pick the second one, and then I'll click the sign-in button. And that's all you need to do. I'm signed in, if you can see at the top there, with that identity. Now, that's all I needed to do because I already, uh, I already had the proof in my browser. And so when I visit the site, I can just give that proof, and that's it. OK, so what does, what does actually happen when you try to log into a site? So say I'm trying to log into Wikipedia. What I would provide Wikipedia with is called an assertion. Now, an assertion is a little bundle that's created by you, by your browser. So not the identity provider, it's created by uh, your browser. And it contains three things. It contains the certificate that you got, so the proof that you own the email address. It contains an audience and an expiry. So the first thing that Wikipedia is going to do when, I, when it gets the assertion from you is it's going to check the audience. Now, the audience is just basically the URL that you're going to, um, the, the first bit of it. And it does that to make sure that, that um, the audience is meant for that site. Now, if you didn't have that, it would mean that Wikipedia, for example, could use the assertion that you sent when you were trying to log, log in there to log in as yourself onto another site. Now, it's not going to work because the other site is also going to check the audience. So that, that's fine. Next thing, you check the expiry. Um, the persona assertions are valid for two minutes. So they're very, very short-lived. And then you check the signature on the certificate. How do you do this? Well, what you do is you go, because this, the, the certificate comes from the email provider, you go to the email provider and say, hey, I'd like to get your, your public key so I could check your signature. This step does not require the site that's using Persona, so Wikipedia, to reveal to the um, email provider who is trying to log in. Right? It's just one public key for everybody and uh, it gets returned to the site. In fact, Wikipedia probably doesn't even need to go to the email provider, uh, if it's like Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo, because it will have cached the key already, right? and it can use it um, directly from the cache. And then what happens uh, once the, everything checks out fine, then Wikipedia logs you in using whatever it is that MediaWiki does, like sending a cookie and, and creating a session, whatever. From, from there on, it's the usual stuff. So it doesn't replace cookies. It's, it's just, um, it just replaces username and password. Now, how much code do you have to write in order to, uh, to do this, to, to add persona support to an application? Well, I wrote a really simple um, application in Python, like a little simple CGI that just lets you log in and shows you who is currently logged into the site. And it took me about 75 lines. Now, that's 75 lines of HTML, client-side JavaScript code, and server-side Python code, all included. So it's really quite a small amount of code. So let's look at the code that would be behind the example that I showed earlier. What happens when you, uh, so first of all, what happens when you load this page is that there's a little bit of JavaScript that gets loaded in the header of that page. So a bit of JavaScript from login.persona.org over HTTPS, of course. Then this is the thing that the site will set up. So we'll call navigator.id.watch um, to, to set up a few things. So there's three different things that it needs to, uh, to set. First one is it needs to indicate to Persona um, if there is a user that's currently logged in to the site. So you pass in an email address like this, or in this case, nobody's logged in yet, so you just pass in no. So that's the first thing. 
Second thing is you need to tell Persona what happens when someone logs in. So that's just you, you, you uh, pass in a function callback that will get run whenever that happens. Um, so I'll come back to, the, to what's in, in there. But the, next, the last thing is you need to tell Persona what happens when the user logs out. And in this case, we're just redirecting to the, log the logout page, which will like, clear the cookie and, and just you know, clear the session. So that, that's actually typically what happens in a lot of applications for the logout bit. OK, so let's do it. Let's click on the sign in button. Now, the sign in button can be uh, any kind of button, like you're not, uh, that, that's not the button that will show up by default. You can choose what you want. It can be a link, but what you need to do is you need to call navigator.id.login. No parameters, just this. And um, this will trigger the dialog box that happens here. And this, so this shows the user all of the identities that they have currently in their browser, the ones that they have um, certificates for. And uh, so we'll pick one, we'll click sign in. And that's when the login function gets invoked. Now, you can do, you can do the many, um, you, you can handle this bit in many different ways. Um, so this is just using uh, jQuery. What we're doing here is we're taking the assertion that we're getting from the user. So assertion is a uh, parameter that gets passed to your function. And we're sending it to the backend. So using post, passing in the assertion, and after everything is done, then we'll redirect to home, right, after, after the, the, the post has been completed. Now, it's very important that you post the assertion to your backend. You do the verification on the server, not on the client, because you can't trust the client. Um, this is a server-side code. So basically, you take the assertion, and then what you can do is you can use the online verifier that we have to uh, verify whether or not the assertion is valid. Now, this involves passing in the assertion to the verifier, but also the audience that you expect. So the audience that you expect is, of course, your own URL. What you get as output from uh, the, the verifier is this little blob of JSON that says status OK or status um, not OK. I think it's just called failed if it's not there. Um, if it is OK, then you get the email of the user. Right? That's the way that you extract the email from the assertion, pretty much. Um, if, you, if, it's, if the status is failed, then you won't get the email, and you'll just get an error message instead. So that's to prevent people from using an email even if the assertion has failed. Um, so that's, that's what you do here. Uh, that's what you get from the verifier. And if it's OK, you just use that email, and you know that everything is fine. And you can you log the user in like this. Now, the last piece, of course, is if you want to log out, you click the logout button. Logout button will call this function. Again, no parameters. This tells Persona that the user has logged out. And um, so we'll log the user out like this and call that function that you had earlier. That, would, that in our case just redirects to the logout page. So just to recap quickly, it, adding persona support to your application involves loading an extra JavaScript application, uh, library, uh, setting up logins and logout callbacks, adding the buttons to your page, and, and calling the right function, navigator ID login logout, and then verifying the proof that you get, verifying the certificate, the assertion that you get from the user. Now, the tricky thing about decentralized services is um, getting started. Because if you, if you try to build a fully distributed system, what's going to happen is that you have to get cooperation from a lot of people. And everybody's going to ask, well, who uses it? Um, how many, you know, like, how many sites are there that use it? How many users do you have? How many browsers support it? All, all of these questions. And um, you don't really, if you're, if you're starting from scratch, like you basically, they have to take it on faith and, uh, and that at some point it's going to work. So it's not a very um, good story to tell people. So what we've done is that we've recognized that, well, fully distributed thing right from the start is not going to work. So what we need is we need fallbacks. We need centralized fallbacks in a few key places. 
First place is for identity providers. Now, what we want to see is we want to see something like this. We want to see assertions for, um, so in this case, francois.id.me, um, that's a domain that supports persona. So we want to see certificates issued by the domain of the email address. Right? That's, that's the, the, how the system is supposed to work. Um, but there are lots of domains that don't support this yet. So what we built is we built a, a, a fallback identity provider at login.persona.org. If you encounter an email address, ironically like this one, um, francois.mozilla.com, Mozilla.com does not yet support Persona natively. Um, we have the code, but it's just not deployed yet. It needs, to, it needs a bit more testing. Um, it doesn't support na uh, Persona natively yet, so what you're going to see instead of seeing issuer Mozilla.com is you're going to see issuer login.persona.org. So the certificate is signed on by Persona on behalf of Mozilla.com. Now, <clears throat> why are we able to do this? Well, we're able to do this because um, we actually verify that you own the email address the same way that everybody else verifies this on the internet, which is when you create your account, we send you an email. The email has a link with a little unique token. When you click on it, that proves to us that you own the email address. So we can actually sign um, statements that you own the email address because we've actually verified it that way. Right? Um, it's, this is only used, of course, if the domain doesn't support Persona natively. As soon as there is native support at the level of the domain, the fallback is not used anymore. But the presence of fallback means that right now we support all email providers. So if, if the domain that you want to use doesn't support Persona, that's fine because the fallback will get used automatically. Can yes. anyone sign? Like it's a fallback special to log on Persona.org? I do my own fallback if I want to. Currently, it's special to, to log in with some Yep. We're, we're not quite sure that there's a, that there's a, there's a need for, for other uh, fallbacks like that, because what we want to see is we want to na see native implementations. Browser support. Well, what we want to see is this. We want to see navigator.id.star be a uh, standard browser feature. So we want to send it through the various standard bodies that, that, that need to have that. And we want to see this in Firefox, Chrome, uh, Safari, uh, IE, hopefully, and everything else, right? <clears throat> but there is no such support yet. There's the beginnings of it in Firefox, 17 or 18, something like that. I'm not quite sure. Um, but um, but, it's, but it's not, there's no native support yet on any browsers. So, what we have now is we have this little bit of JavaScript. Um, this, if you recall, is the thing that 123Done loads in its header. And what this does is that it sets up a full JavaScript implementation of Persona. So full fallback in JavaScript of all of the crypto stuff that I talked about. Which means that we support all of these browsers today. So it's actually pretty good um, coverage right now. We also support all of these browsers on uh, mobiles. Now, the last piece that is centralized is this one. So the example that I, that I gave you uh, for in Python for verifying the assertion involve this uh, verifier. Now, the reason why we provide this is to make it easier for people to actually support Persona on their sites. Right? It was the, if you recall the, the verification of the assertion, in, in the Python sample code was about three lines of code because it was just using this. Um, the other reason why we provide this is that the crypto formats are still not finalized. We're still playing with it. And um, if you were to, to verify this yourself, you'd have to keep up with any changes that we're making. Um, but at some point, we'll, we'll standardize on, on that format once, once we've got all of the features. In the meantime, we recommend that people use this. Um, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is really something like this. Pirate Browser ID is a library that will verify assertions client side for you without using login.persona.org, uh, verifier.login.persona.org. Um, it does have a mode to use the online verifier if you want to, 
uh, but, but it does do all of the crypto in Python as well. So that's where we want to go um, later on. So, we, so this, this sort of centralized piece will uh, just go away. Um, in other words, it's ready for your site. It's kind of open for business. And um, if you, like we use it at Mozilla in production for a number of sites and there are people that, that are using it as well outside of Mozilla. Um, if you want to know more, there's a whole bunch of uh, places that you can go. Uh, if you use Django, um, there's this uh, second last link there, Django Browser ID, is a really easy way to, uh, to add support for Persona because basically you just add the plugin and turn it on in your config file and everything works. Now we, we use that all over Mozilla so it does work. If it, if it stops working, it'll break a, lot, a, whole lot, a whole bunch of our sites and we'll notice. Um, because some of them have quite a few users. Um, now, I'm happy to take questions, but also if you want to at any point during the conference to talk to me about, especially you know, if, if, the, if you have needs uh, in, in your uh, business or, or your projects for an identity system that does something and we're not doing it yet, please talk to us because we really care about this. We're putting quite a lot of resources behind this idea. We think the web needs an identity system and we want that to be built into all of, of the browsers as a standard feature. So if you have any advice or questions or whatever, please feel free to ask at any time. Wait, wait. <laughs> oh, and I have stickers here, if you want stickers. Um, oh, geez. sorry. Uh, when you showed your browser coming in, you had your two identified email addresses. So I'm going into my internet cafe to log in. Mm -hmm. How do I get that on to the browser that I'm using at my internet cafe, and how do I get it off if I forget to get rid of my verified cert from my browser session or however it's done? Yep, so one, one thing I didn't, I didn't talk about is um, the idea of, of uh, certificate revocation and how long certificate lasts. We don't do revocation because we, we use short-lived certificates. So in the case of, uh, of like an internet cafe, uh, your, uh, your certificate will be valid for, I believe, one hour. So if you forget about it, <clears throat> in one hour, it's, it can no longer be used to produce new assertions. Um, it, uh, in, I think the second time you log in or something like that, we ask you, hey, you've logged in with this before. Is this actually your, your, your own computer? If, if you say yes to that, then the cert will be valid for a whole day, and you will keep the cookie for longer and stuff like that. Um, but basically, <clears throat> the, there's no need to, to take your certificates with you because when you log into Persona, they will be uh, copied to your browser. Like the, the, with the JavaScript uh, fallback, the certificates are stored in local storage. So they will just be, uh, like on each device that you use, there'll be a different cert that will get refreshed whenever uh, they expire, as long as, you can, as long as it's still logged in. And if you like, lose your device, change your password, then you won't be able to get new certs anymore. Uh, do you have any protection against situation where users loses uh, access to his email? It's been hacked. What uh, happens? What's uh, user's email been hacked. What happens? Do you if have any protection hacked. against it? Um, so there, there's, there's two cases. If, if you have native support for uh, Persona, then your email account is your identity provider, right? So you need to sort that out because you've just been hacked. I mean, it's, 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 it's the same thing. Um, in the case of the, so like, in the, like if, you have, if you have uh, Gmail, then uh, there's, like all of these things you can do to prevent that from happening, like two-factor off and so on. But there's also like a manual recovery thing that you can do. And it's kind of like painful, but it's as it should be um, <clears throat> for that kind of stuff. If you're using the fallback for uh, the, the login the persona.org that checks that you own your email address, um, <clears throat> that's, um, there's no easy way to detect that, you've, that your email has been compromised. Um, but that's kind of a general web problem, you know, like you, someone can hack into your LinkedIn account, your Twitter account and everything if they have control of your email address. So we're not solving that problem, but it's not a new problem either. 
What makes this one um, different from the others? We've got Open ID, single sign-on. The government's just announced um, Real Me. Um, there is just so many open formats for this to happen. What's what's going to make this one stand out from others? Well, so we think that this, so like as I said, oh, this one doesn't have the privacy problems that Open ID has. Um, I think it's a big one. This one is distributed, so it doesn't require a centralized authority. And um, we want to make to have it built into the browser, so it will be, you know, the de facto standard for the web. Sorry, we ran out of time. You can grab Leon later. Um, I'd like to thank you again, Francois. Um, and it's time for lunch. So, cheers. <laughs>